So good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Alex Mackey. I work for Zero. I'm going to be talking to you about brain-computer interfaces. So probably one of the first questions you've got is, what exactly is a brain-computer interface? Well, at its simplest level, it enables communication between a computer and the brain itself. But why on earth would we want to do this kind of thing? <laughs> we'll let that guy go again. <laughs> So I think there's three main usages for this technology. I think probably the predominant use is that it has the possibility to drastically improve the quality of life for people suffering certain disabilities and illnesses. Paralyzed people could potentially communicate to other people. We could have blind people being able to see. All sorts of things, and some of which I'm going to be covering later. Next up, it can help us understand our brain and nervous system better we could develop new interfaces. It's not too far-fetched to think that we could be controlling our mobile devices or our personal computers through the power of force alone. This is the last GIF of uh, Donald Trump I'm going to have in this presentation. <laughs> How do these things work? Well, it's all about electricity. As human beings, we've actually known for some time that electricity and the brain are very interlinked. So the ancient Romans, they would actually treat headaches with these torpedo fish, which is that kind of stingray thing over there. Now, you can only imagine how someone came to the conclusion that this was a uh, great way to treat a headache or how this was actually applied. But we've known for a long time that the brain and electricity are interlinked. Our brain is made up of uh, these uh, cells here, and through a chemical process, there's an electrical charge generated. And we can look at this electrical charge in the brain and we know from um, performing certain tasks and measuring this charge that different areas of the brain are associated with different tasks. So, for example, the frontal area of the brain is concerned with reasoning, planning, speech, movements, and emotions. And we've got a guy called Hans Berger um, to thank for this. Now, Hans um, was uh, uh, in the military, and he was training, and he fell off his horse. And many hundreds of miles away, his sister had a sudden realization that something bad had happened to her brother, and she felt compelled to write Hans a letter to check that he was OK. And it's lucky for us that she did, because Hans then became obsessed with this idea of a psychic link between people and carried out a lot of research on the brain. And he went on to develop something called the EEG. And this enables us to measure electrical frequencies in the brain. It's often used um, to diagnose and look at certain disorders, such as epilepsy and brain tumors. There's two main types of brain-computer um, interface implants, non-invasive and invasive. With non-invasive means, such as EEG, this guy um, got stuff attached to his head there, or um, an MRI machine there, we can look at what's going on um, to some degree in the brain. And then we have more invasive things, such as poor old Ratty there has some stuff directly plugged into his brain. And then we have a roach over here, and you can actually buy a kit in order to um, control these roaches, um, which is a pretty disturbing um, type of idea. Um, but they do have different advantages, these types of implants. So an invasive implant, you can obtain a lot more information, but it does have some other issues such as um, infection risk, not to mention any ethical constraints around this. Also, some of the non-invasive means certainly aren't the most portable of things. So how do brain-computer interfaces work? Well, at its simplest level, um, we would look at performing a specific action we're going to want to program or uh, target. We'll then measure the brain activity associated with this, and then we'll repeat this action many, many times in order to train the device what this particular picture of electrical activity looks like in order to um, generate this action. And then next time, by just measuring the activity alone, hopefully we can trigger this action. Let's look at some studies of people who are actually using this technology and demonstrating its usage. Jacques Vidal, way back in 1973, demonstrated that people could learn to control a cursor on an 8x8 checkboard. You can imagine a paralyzed patient could potentially use this to go and pick letters of the alphabet in order to communicate. Donahue demonstrated people could learn to control a robotic arm. DeBell. And for me, this is one of the most interesting of all. He actually managed to restore vision to blind patients. He had a camera, and this camera would um, translate um, the vision uh, into the patient's brain and produce um, some kind of picture. 
And some of Dobell's patients were actually able to drive a car slowly around the laboratory car park from the input that he gave these guys. What's also interesting about Dobell was he carried out his studies in private and in a location, in a location where he wasn't subject to certain ethical and scientific constraints. Matt Nagel, again, a tetraplegic um, could control an artificial hand. Ninandek and Do, they had a guy here who could walk a short distance, and this is just using an EEG, a non-invasive implant device. He was able to control some of his paralyzed muscles. So what may surprise you more is that there's even consumer devices available for you guys to actually go and play with some of this yourself. The cheapest device is this thing called the NeuroSky here. It's about $80, and it's a very simple um, EEG reader. Uh, they've supposedly been used to um, train uh, archery teams. Um, it's got various games where it looks at certain patterns of waves in order to see how relaxed you are and you can control things. Some of that's getting a bit crystals and stuff for me. <laughs> the emotive device, this is produced by a company in Sydney. It's about 400 US dollars. This is probably the best consumer device. And what this has is it has a program where you can learn to um, control, so you can move this cube, cube about through the power of force alone, and you can use this to trigger certain actions on your computer, whether it's um, pressing a specific key or calling up a specific application. Again, this has some enormous usages for people suffering certain disabilities and illnesses. So in conclusion, it is early days, and there really are a number of challenges remaining with this. But brain-computer interfaces have massive potential. And you can even play with this area yourself. Thank you very much. <laughs>